So thank you all for coming and for not coming. Um, <laughs> um, this has been a very exhausting week and also a week where we've made great progress on a lot of the concrete parts about where the industry is going. In this talk, I would like to give a few questions for the audience to think about, given that now we're entering the layer two part of the day. And layer two part of the, the layer two part of the day, many people here that you're gonna hear next are working on it full time. I'm no longer spending as much time on this, but I'm gonna try to offer a zoomed out view and some questions for the audience to think as people do their talks and for hopefully to reach some deeper insights. My name is Georgios, I'm the CTO of Fire So we'll start with what is an L2? I see John in the audience and Togrul in the audience as well. We'll see how that will go. We'll talk about shortly what the differentiators between layer twos can be and what are net new exciting features that can be introduced. Then I will pose some interesting hypotheticals for shared sequencers, and then I will have a one slide for prover, proposer, builder separation, or whatever the canonical name ends up, which our next speaker will also tell us about. So we will talk about layer two just from the context of um, not bridging, because there's been many debates, and I have no interest in engaging in any of them. Um, the main thing about the layer twos that we care about right now is that you have some off-chain state, some off-chain state in another place, in another place, and then that off-chain off state gets posted to layer one, which is called the data availability layer, and that ensures that anybody that wants to recreate the state of the layer two, they can go and look at the layer one, and they can very easily derive it. Typically, there is a deterministic derivation function different in each system, um, which allows you to do that. Beyond that, a layer two is an L1. It's a chain. It has a database, it has a runtime, it has an RPC, it has a peer-to-peer -peer layer, it has a bunch of cryptography maybe. It's a standard distributed system. We know how to optimize them. These systems, they bottleneck on IO and on state growth. If the thing that matters to you is decentralization and the ability for an individual to verify, these are the two things that matter. IO bottlenecks how fast you can sync a chain. State growth bottlenecks how big your chain can be. And if you want to scale Ethereum or anything else, how you do it is by launching many of these layer twos. And the rollup centric roadmap is all about that. Now, some problems for people to think about are, one, how are we going to do composability across the same flavor of a layer two? So if I have two OP stack chains and they want to talk to each other, how are they going to communicate without necessarily going through the layer one? If I have OP stack and Arbitrum or ZK stack or Stark stack or, you know, I don't know, um, is there some extra difficulty in making these two communicate? Are these systems even compatible or whatever runtime they need to support? Or are they just looking like it on the outside and things on the inside look a lot different? And the natural follow-up question to that is, what does change in the internals and how does that impact the externals? How did an implementation detail make its way to the interface? And one example could be that people maybe have optimized for MEV extraction on Geth because they understand, OK, these are the bottlenecks. But maybe, for example, on the Polygon ZKVM, maybe it's different. I don't know. Now let's talk a bit about what are the unique things that you can get from a layer two. First and foremost, from the side chains paper from 2015 by Blockstream, experimentation. Experimentation, experimentation. We can try new things without breaking the base layer. And then I will pose some bullets with some questions about them. So when we have faster block times and or soft, soft confirmations, what does that mean about the MEV extracted in these blocks? Does it really mean that more frequent blocks means less or more MEV? What happens outside of that system? And how does the synchronization time between these two systems change, which directly, of course, affects the MEV extracted? 
the proposal set in rollups can be less decentralized without losing safety, with some cost to liveness, um, but not total degradation. Naturally, having a distributed system means it's more it's higher SLA, which is good. If the system allows a custom transaction pool, it also allows for custom ordering. FCFS, we'll hear Patrick McCory talk about that in a bit. I also don't know, but all of these are levers that one can pull depending on the MEV profile that they want the layer two to have. Or if you don't have a transaction pool and uh, people just hammer the sequencer, what are you gonna do? Proof of work? Are you gonna add identity? How are you going to prevent this spam that happens on the wire that comes from the client to the server? And the obvious thing, which is not, I'm realizing the last bullet is off topic, but I'll roll with it, is that we have the bundle, a bundled role. Um, a sequencer is both a proposer and a builder, and naturally, you want to keep the sequencer lean to allow for, in the future, as many of them to be around. So the same thesis for PBS on level one applies to level two, separation of concerns, how you build optimized systems. I will not talk about decentralized sequencing. I think it's kind of, again, an implementation detail. Any centralized system, you can replace it with a BFT version of it, put it on Turner Mint, put it on some other consensus protocol, and that gives you redundancy. And some A's or B's here are, do you enshrine the shared sequencer in your system? For example, um, the OP stacks super chain, is it the thing, and is it something that gets you better performance than having something like an espresso sequencer on top of it? I would think that like any, any time that you have a core protocol operation and you leave the metal, but that means that it becomes more expensive. One or many shared sequencers, do you aggregate them? How, how does that go? We saw the fractal aggregation of proofs that Vitalik showed earlier. The aggregation theory can play in any layer. L2 specific or close flavor, again, same thing. And the thing I want to drive home, shared sequencers are not magic, you know? They don't actually solve all the world's problems. They give you atomic, top of block, inclusion. The most topic, classic example being the base rollup. What is the room for differentiation? I also don't know, um, but I know that like nobody else either knows. So what do? Um, and these are two other questions around the bridge and the atomic success, which I still have only seen Stroman answers to, and I think we should do better. One concrete proposal on how to get to cross-chain composability, and I realize this is kind of dense and low context, so I'm happy to expand later, but we don't have enough time, is that maybe you can have a shared sequencer that indeed only guarantees inclusion without execution, but then you can have a bunch of builders where they cross-chain simulate, and Vitalik kind of alluded to that, that you can cross-chain simulate the block. The builders are indeed going to be running nodes and simulation engines for every chain that they support. And the builder is going to land a bundle that is going to be landing transactions for all up one, two, and three together. And the insight here is that we take the MEV builder role and we just bundle more um, functionality of it, like make it heavier. And basically, the shared sequencer is funneling enough the MEV builder, poetic. Um, this is my final slide. Um, I want to talk a bit about this because it's a topic I deeply care about on ZK proofs and how the market will evolve. Um, the prover right now is again run colo with the sequencer. And the sequencer, as we said, is also a builder. We really need to unbundle these two. And there's many, many ways that we could do it. My favorite work was a paper by a good friend of mine, Akis Katis, that was called the Proof of Necessary Work, and described a way where you can introduce nonce grinding, a la proof of work, in the snark generation process. And that let you have a leaderless system, or rather, a system where the leader is not known ahead of time um, for proof uh, generation, for proof proposal. Naturally, anything that is like proof of work-esque, it has a lot of wasted effort, but maybe it's like very egalitarian. Um, so maybe like the next step from that is, should we do a consensus protocol for the leader election? Um, you know, let's elect the proposer. Let's agree, let's put up some stake or something. We elect the leader, the leader does it. Standard techniques that we have seen used in consensus protocols are going to be used for prover selection. And the other thing that I don't think I've seen anywhere so far 
Um, and I just added it as a straw man, and I realized that it's probably broken, and there's probably things to do, but I wanted to say it, is that as a ZK proof is generated, you can actually observe that parts of the proof are generated in a pipeline sense. The most trivial example, I have a block with 10 transactions. Transaction one is executed. It generates some witness data. That witness data is supposed to get fed to a snark. But while it's getting executed and it's getting proven, another transaction is also getting executed and getting proven. And another, and another, and another. Do the provers need to be the same thing? Can there not be a market for proof aggregation? The things that Vitalik was talking about. Can there not be something where proof one goes to John, proof two goes to Nick, proof two, three goes to Josh, you know, and you can keep doing that. It seems like we can come up with collaborative proof generation protocols that abuse this pipeline structure of like proof generation. I don't know how that, how that will look like, but if somebody is interested in talking to me about it, please find me after the talk. And the final question is how do you distribute the fees? Again, the perennial question in the MEV supply chain or compositional game theory is the new term I hear. Um, how do you put the fees? Where does value accrue? You know, um, I also don't know. But it's something interesting to think about. Um, I have three minutes, and uh, it would be good if we can do some questions, perhaps. Thank you. Anyone has any questions from the audience? Oh, I see. Uh, can you elaborate a bit more on how cross-chain or cross-L2 interaction can be facilitated by this shared sequencer model for those of us who are unfamiliar with the literature? Yeah, of course. Um, can we get the slides back up? Um, so the shared sequencer is an entity that is ordering things and doesn't really know how to execute them, or if it were to know how to execute them, it would need to have execution nodes for every chain it is ordering for, because otherwise it would be ordering invalid things. And ordering invalid things might be okay if your chain can support no ops. You know, um, you just say anything that's invalid, just like skip it. This has junk, this leaves junk on the chain, but maybe it's fine. Um, so. Perhaps um, what to do is that you have the shared sequencer, which is basically a privileged entity for submitting um, data to the chain. And how does the data get ordered to get into that privileged entity? You could have builder one and builder two, but basically, or builder one for simplicity, who is running nodes for chain one and chain two. And what they will do is that it will publish a bundle or a full block template to the layer one, where the first transactions in that bundle are going to be all the roll-up A transactions, and the next transactions in that bundle are going to be all the roll-up B transactions. And because that person is a builder and is, has run the simulations on every chain, they can guarantee that by being at top of the block, they can guarantee that the transactions are going to be valid. So by doing that, you can hack your way into shared sequencing in a very clean way. Um, I realize this is a bit dense, and I don't know if it answered the question sufficiently. Yeah, yeah, it makes sense. Um, uh, this also goes back to what Vitalik says about aggregation. I'm just wondering how this helps cross-chain interaction. Oh, um, well, I don't think that you can do callbacks. You know, callbacks, I don't know who has said that, like, you can do, you know, contract A calls contract B and then it calls back. It's a bit uh, uh, unclear because people are doing, like, right now the way the rollups work is that they submit one transaction, per one big bundle per block. If we could interleave bundles, if we could say top of block part A is, like, bundle for rollup A and then rollup B and then rollup A again, maybe we could do something where I can call chain A and then chain B, chain, chain A, and then it calls me back. Um, the main things that we support in this design are cross-chain message parsing, passing, and maybe cross-chain bridging. Um, I'm seeing a timeout, so I don't know if I have time for more. 
Sure. I think the person in the back was first. The person in the back. Yeah, nice talk. So um, I just have a follow-up question uh, regarding the shared sequencing and also PBS for the L2. Like uh, if we have sort of this um, uh, shared sequencer, actually two questions. The first one, uh, if it's really like sort of shared sequencer, do you think it will overwhelm that machine? I mean, if the sequencer used for multiple rollups? Yeah, um, like that's the first question. Second question, I. Um, like Maybe let's do one, let's give it as one. Oh, sorry. Um, so is the question that the shared sequencer can be very heavy? I'm not sure I understood that. Like if that is the case, the way that you do shared sequencers, you basically need to make them like cross-chain DA aggregators before you land the chain, before you land the bundle to layer one. But you do not want them to be running the execution of these chains. So by doing that, you can keep the sequencer as a light DA consensus protocol effectively, which is what Espresso is, for example. Um, and then you land your data to the real DA protocol. Um, sorry, just a quick one. Uh, but in that case, like, for example, if we really pass the message across the rollups, right, uh, via the sequencing, but do we need to wait for the confirmation from one rollup um, before like, we really execute another message uh, dependent on the... For sure. Yeah. yeah, yeah, obviously, of course. Any transaction needs confirmations. Zero conf, one conf is insecure. I see. So in that case, it's like sequencing plus execution and uh, DA, right? 